Howdy everyone, it's me once again, the one and only Killer Dan. And today, as you can see, I'm still continuing my Disney movie marathon where I'll be talking about their movies, of course, merchandising, theme parks, streaming services, I don't know, whatever the case may be. If it's related to Disney in any shape or form, then yes, of course, I'll talk about it. So, of course, as you can see, it's again, for like the hundredth time, it's going to be about Star Wars. And again, it was something to do with religion. This religious individual I'm about to speak about, of course, wants to go back to the past where things seemed a lot more simpler. And somehow, Star Wars is doing something bad here, of course. Because this individual wants things to not change, and size change, and of course... Just like how during the 1950s where the housewife was doing her thing and then she had to stay home. Well, at least it would be a choice. If she chooses to do this, then it's on her, I guess, and whatnot. But what I'm trying to get at, since society is changing again in this day and age, of course, we're going to have one more rights and whatnot. And yes, of course, I still believe that, yes, these times people won't just want women to be nothing but baby factories. Oh, great. I'm talking about pregnancies again. Oh, wonderful. But anyway, I mean, if a woman wants to have a bunch of kids, don't get me wrong, it should be her choice. She shouldn't be forced to do this kind of a thing, but a lot of these individuals want women to be, of course, a certain way, be virgins before this, of course. And that's pretty, that's pretty unhinged in its own way, because if she's a virgin, if she had a child before marriage, like Woodlock or whatever, she should be stoned to death and whatnot. Yeah, it gets pretty... It's pretty damn dark when you think about it. I could go on with this alone. But anyway, again, if she wants this kind of thing, it should be up to her. And she, if she wants to do the whole housewife kind of thing, with like from the 1950s, again, it should be up to her. She should be made to do it whatsoever. But anyway, this individual I'm about to talk about, of course, wants to protect the family. Because through Jesus' name, wants to make sure that society as a whole goes into the right path make sure everyone will of course just go through in, the, in god's eyes in god's words i should say because guy ha god himself has an idea he, god can see everything apparently but i'm putting more i guess emphasis on the background here because this is someone i have not spun about before really just so you know this is someone i have not spun about as of yet and of course this individual is quite old himself of course and yes, and whatever he has to say about Star Wars is completely wrong. Well, that's typical when it comes to these people. Even if the party right, still wrong. I swear, if this movie literally had, let's say, female robots carrying babies inside their stomachs and be housewives, like, like actual machines, or maybe cyborg women, yeah, that'd be like an interesting storyline. Cyborg women carrying babies. That'd be cool, I guess. Hey, Star Wars, I was just giving an idea for, for a future movie. Well, yeah, th this would be something. Of course, it could be interesting if done right. Cyberpunk has this whole human-robot-cyborg hybrid kind of thing going on. So there's that. <laughs> and you can actually do that in the game, by the way. But, of course, people don't want, like, robot nuns in the Star Wars, of course. So even in the Star Wars universe, to preach about God. Even though this kind of a thing, when it comes to the nun, even though there's different ways you can do that... In this day and age, the more modern take, I guess. But a lot of people want this to continue to some extent, even though this was a thing way back when. But like we say, moreover, this individual is going to talk about how how this franchise could have some kind of influence and whatnot. But okay, I know. Let's just get to it, shall we? I don't know. I don't know. Let's get into it. All right. And just for, just so you know, folks, the audio on on the individuals and it's kind of hard to hear because, of course, it's been incompetent when it comes to technology. Of course. So I'm just laying the heads up. I'm I did my best to uh, buff up the audio a bit more, but I was wondering so much going to do. So here we go. Another thing I want to say real quick is that I'm going to have to split this in more than one part because, as always, these people ramble on and on and on. So anyway, let's just get to it, I guess. Finally. I started to say, no, the Bible even needs to be critiqued by human reason. If it doesn't make sense to my mind, even if the Bible says it, then I'm not going to make sense to you. Right? So modernism came along the scene. Modernism was very popular and, and resulted in three major theories that had a huge impact on um, the modern world. One of them um, was 
a, an egalitarian view, I mean, excuse me, a view that people are equal. In other words, no, no longer royals and societal divisions. Well, of course, she's going to get annoyed at the fact that people in this day and age only get treated with equals. Like the whole thing with the set about women earlier, folks, and whatnot. So, yeah, he's taking issue of how society in this day and age is changing compared to back then. I do find kind of funny that this is somehow a problem. Didn't the boomer generation rebel against their parents for like, in the same kind of way? And then... The generation after that did the exact same thing. We built against their parents. You seem to you seen there's a pattern in here. And then the Manelio generation did the exact same thing because their parents are too damn uptight. Somehow this relates to Star Wars. I don't realize how, but I mean granted Princess Leia was inspired by feminism at the time, of course. And I guess it's something like that. That's the only like the thing I think of really at the moment is that okay, the fact that Princess Leia was inspired by, by feminism. How feminism is supposed to be equal rights for both genders, men and women. So there was that, I guess. I don't know. Of that nature, but everybody's equal, and so therefore you have democracy springing up and those kinds of things. People demanding the right to vote. Okay, that's a huge movement in the modern period. A second one was advances in science. And especially what really propelled modernism on was the, was the publication of a particular book uh, just before the Civil War called The Origin of the Species by Charles Darwin, in which there was an explanation. Up to that point, you had Dias who said God made everything, but he's just kind of steps back and let it go. He doesn't get involved in our lives. After Darwin, people are able to say God didn't make it. It made itself. Okay. And then you get to the late or late 19th century, early 20th century, and you have the psychological theories of Sigmund Freud and others, which become very popular and influential, and have a way to describe the human soul apart from religion, apart from the Bible and Christianity. Okay, so fighting for equal rights, or why equal rights, that in itself isn't a theory, okay? And also, when it comes to evolution, that's not an actual theory either. And yes, of course, in this day and age, of course they removed reading the Bible as a recommendation, as a requirement from the schools, I say should they should never bring back prayer in schools. They shouldn't. It just seems like a form of control if you ask me. And of course you can complain about that. Anyway. Modernism has this influence on it on the culture. Human reason becomes the judge of all truth. Second, postmodernism. Now this is sounds real it's ultimately postmodernism is just ultra modernism. But what postmodernism, the most influential philosopher uh, in postmodernism, really kind of the person who kicked it off was a man named George Frederick Nietzsche, who uh, was uh, died around the year 1900. He was a German philosopher, and he, he was a, a nihilist, which basically means nothing has any meaning. Meaning's not double. Okay, real upbeat philosophy. <laughs> um, highly influential in the 20th century, though. Uh, was he influenced Adolf Hitler, for example? He, he expressed the idea that eventually people are going to get place where they're supermen, and, uh, you know, people will evolve to that level, and we should be encouraging that, um, not superman in the sense of, you know, flying around with a cape, but, you know, as an ultra. I mean, yes, of course, things were not the same like it was in the 1940s and 1950s, and things, of course, there was a culture shift when it comes to maybe the 1960s and 1970s, and then, if you want to go... Further back, the war in 20s. Of course, the war in 20s were really different compared to, let's say, how things were back in the 1980s or 90s. Of course, things were changed. So, what's the problem here exactly? Well, guess what? Hitler seized on that. Near and all those kinds of things. Um, Hitler didn't really understand he just thought, but he, he used it for his own in the name of the German philosopher, so Hitler used it. So, postmodernism basically says this. Okay, whereas modernism said truth can be known by the human mind and human reason is the judge of all truth, postmodernism said truth isn't knowable. This person says this, this one says this, we don't really know if it's true. There might be truth out there, but we can't know what it is, and therefore judgment must be with. Okay, I don't see what Hitler has to do with anything. I mean, yes, there were people that believe one race is better than the other. And to some extent, unfortunately, that mindset didn't really completely leave. But yes, Hitler thought the Germans, the pure-blooded Germans anyway, were this the greatest thing since sliced bread. 
And yes, of course, he, more specifically, the German people who were more athletic, who were in tip-top shape and whatnot, but okay. All opinions must be respectful. All right, that was very common in the 20th century. Third, spiritual vacuum. Now think about that. You have modernism and postmodernism chiseling away at what they thought was the foundations of Christianity. Nietzsche said, God is dead for we have killed him. And he didn't believe God really existed and he had killed him. What he meant was, he got rid of the idea of God. We don't need it anymore. It's a, it's a philosophical construct. We don't need it anymore. And he set that aside. But guess what this does? When you blow up the foundations of the Bible and those kinds of things, and you, they, if they thought they did, it leaves a spiritual vacuum. So what are you going to do? They dismiss Christianity. Again, okay, how people practice Christianity when Hitler was around is, uh, of course, back then that was the norm. Yes, or how people practice religion in Scotland around the same time, or if not sooner than that. Of course, it can be different as time goes. Yes, of course, even during the 1960s or 1970s, where people practice the, the whole thing with Jesus and whatnot. Of course, it's gonna be different on how they practice it before that. Yes, it changed. Even the Christian believes the practices about do change over the years. That's true, but so much. No religious options to replace it. It wasn't as if Islam swept in to replace it or something of that nature. This resulted in a spiritual vacuum in the lives of people in the 20th century, especially post the 1920s. All right, the Roaring Twenties. I've read several historians that have said this that they believe the 1930s would have been the 1960s if it weren't for the Depression. All right, he just mentioned the one thing I brought, the whole thing with the Roaring Twenties. I actually remember the Roaring Twenties, because we have to keep in mind, I was around for quite some time. It's a fun time, actually. But he's arguing that he was doing, he was looking into some studies how the, if everything kept the same, the Roaring Twenties, then the 1930s would have been more like the 1960s. How true is that? I'm not quite too sure. Like, the 1960s would have been around... Like the attitude, I can't, I'm guessing the culture, as he's referring to, like the attitudes and whatnot, would have came a lot sooner. And, okay, I still don't know what any of that has to do with, with anything. Even what, what he's saying is true, it would have, the, 19, the 1930s would have been how like the 1960s turned up to be. Even if that was true, was, I kind of find skeptical in some ways. But even if it was true, what does that have to do with Star Wars? I'm not quite sure. Star Wars, the first Star Wars film was released during the 1970s, the late 1970s to be more precise. So I guess somehow a connection? That the way philosophy and thought was going in America in the 1920s and the roaring 20s, that the 60s would have happened in the 30s and the, the revolution in America. But the problem is, when you don't know if you can eat tomorrow, you don't get all worked up about all the stuff that happened in the 1960s. You get worried about eating, right? So that generation was changed, and then those young men who grew up in that in the 30s ended up getting sucked off the war, and again, it changed that generation. So the World War II generation was really the last modernist generation. World War II, we could even see the Korean War generation, but those of you who were born in the 20s or 30s, uh, you were the last modern. Okay, I was actually born a lot sooner than that. I was born in uh, way earlier. But okay, so if anyone that was born in the 1920s, are you referring to the silent era, silent generation? And I mean, yes, of course, I will agree that a lot of people born in this specific era did a lot of great things. And how a lot of factories and a lot of modern day things today have that generation to thank. The, Bur the Burmers had a lot of so a lot of people to think from that area, Gen X, the Mineralios, a lot, even Gen Z, a lot of these stuff nowadays, they have the silent generation thing because they got, how do I put this, they got the bottle warning, so to speak. So yes, a lot of fantastic, wonderful things did come out during the silent generation. I will agree on that. Are you trying to say that this was the last generation to do something fantastic? I mean, they weren't the only generation, but they did it. Got the ball rolling, I would say that. Are you trying Are you trying to take all the credit because you're a Christian? That makes you mighty arrogant when you think about it, but okay. Oh boy, can you imagine if Tinkerbell actually lived through this specific area? You could just think about the number of different things that she could have done with her friends. 
Hey, Disney, that's a what-if scenario right there. Yeah, do a hypothetical situation with that. I'll see it. Generation would have said this. Okay, truth is knowable and reason, you know, there's truth to know out there and reason we should use our mind and judgment. All right, people who were born in the 1940s and the 1950s are known as the baby boom generation. They're the first postmodern generation. The first one, you know, Nietzsche died in 1900 to take Nietzsche's ideas and start saying truth is knowable, so... You know, everybody's opinions are equally valid in these kinds of things. I remember reading a, a book by a man who was, I think he was a, a legal professor at Yale Law during the 1960s, and he watched the law students dragging out the very expensive law books and burning them in the student square out of the law library and just shook his head at, you know, why are you a, a studying in law school if you're burning the law books? This makes no sense. And he asked his students in the classroom the next day, why were they burning law books? And one of the students said... Again, that just seems like he's taking credit, at least his version of Christianity, he's just taking credit all the wonderful events that had occurred during the 1920s. Or the, the Senate generation, I guess, to be more specific here. Like the events of the court, the wheel, and all that. At least more, at least more of an approved version of the wheel, anyway. Stuff like this is why we're not using horses anymore at all. I mean, unless I know it's I know a specific situation, we would use horses, I guess. But a lot of the great inventions today could be traced back to back then. And he's assuming that it's because of God. So it just seems like he's taking credit for all this, like it was mentioned earlier. That just seems really arrogant. So you mean to tell me that this is only happening through divine intervention? That's so stupid. In that case, why why didn't God allow this to occur way, way, way sooner? I mean, okay, I know that a lot of, according to a lot of Christians like him, they believe that the earth itself is roughly two 2,000 years old, which is not a reality, but okay. It would all be better if both students and professors admitted that nobody knows anything. And he said, I looked at that student and said, I'll agree with half of that proposition. <laughs> <laughs> in other words, the students don't know anything. Um, <clears throat> but that's postmodernism. Okay, now I'm using, if you'll follow with me for a minute here. And then what happened? Okay, in the 1960s, once you jettison Christianity and things aren't knowable, you're going to be attracted to religions that say that. Guess what religions tend to say that? You've got another god? Just add it to our pantheon. Hinduism. Okay, Buddhism, Taoism, those kinds of things from the East. So I didn't live through this time, but I remember hearing about it. Uh, what did the Beatles do in the 1960s, other than make music? They went off to India, right? Studied spirituality under, you know, gurus in India, and these kinds of things. That was not only the Beatles who did that. There were a whole bunch of people from that generation that did that. And so what happened is the Eastern religions came in and became part of American culture. The problem is Americans didn't really understand them. Here's the problem with American made-up religion. To say that the last great generation was the 19, was the silent generation, because of the 1920s or whatever, I find that debatable. I mean, yes, of course, there's lots of wonderful things that came out from the silent generation. The boomers have a lot of stuff to thank. Same thing with the Gen X, the Minelios, and yeah, of course, the Gen X. Of course, Gen Z, I mean. So, yes, of course, there's a lot of stuff that can, can be traced to back then. I mean, yes, I'm also glancing glance over a lot of stuff, too, because concerning the fact that this video will be a lot longer than it would be otherwise. It's already a fairly lengthy of a video anyway. I mean, don't get me wrong, there's that, of course. And yes, he's also getting mad at the fact that people could choose what religion they could believe in. And, and what's wrong with that? And, of course, the, I've discussed this before, that there's multiple different hundreds of thousands of denominations of Christianity. And of course, he's going to act as if his version of Christianity is the best thing ever. Even though literally all the others would say the exact same to him towards themselves. Every good, every religion, and uh, there's only one true and living God, only one true religion, and that's biblical Christianity. But let's say this. For any religion to have a good influence on its society, it has to demand something of the people who are part of it. In other words, if you're going to be a Buddhist monk, then you have to go meditate. You know what I mean? Just wearing a yellow robe doesn't cut it. You follow what I'm saying? If you're going to be a Muslim, you've got to pray five, five times a day. The religion's not going to change your society unless you do the stuff Islam says. 
Okay? That's the only way it's going to change your culture. Here's the problem. is Americans, what we do is we pick and choose. We pick the parts of religions we like. This is what our culture does. And don't keep the parts we don't like. So guess what parts we don't like? Getting up at 5 a.m. to pray toward the East Port Mecca we don't like. So we don't do that one. Meditating for hours and hours in the cold on top of a mountain somewhere. We don't do that. That's no fun. Okay, so we pick and choose, and what we do is it, it's like it's a, a religious buffet is what American culture does. And it takes that religious buffet, and it, it's like a child at Golden Corral, right? Now, when I go to Golden Corral... Uh, yes, of course, those specific <laughs> traditions when it comes to Christian faith, it depends on which one you talk about. He's glanced it over. I mean, yes... It's a recommendation for some Christian to wake up really early in the morning, like five, maybe six, to do a specific thing, like some kind of ritual or whatever. So, yes, some of these individuals will get really up really early in the morning to do some praying or what have you. Why they're doing a certain activity, I don't know. I mean, yes, there's been multiple, and there'll be multiple practices that will be done when it comes to Christianity. Yes, it depends which one you're referring to, which denomination. So this kind of whatever practice you're referring to, it can vary. It can vary from this to this or this. Just like the how the Jehovah's Witnesses will practice their belief system is not going to be the same as the Catholics, and how they will practice their faith is not going to be the same how the Mormons would do it and whatnot, or how anybody else would do it. And there's many denominations of the Catholic faith as well, so that could vary from person to person. On top of all that. Of course, yes, even back in the day, this kind of thing didn't seem really like it was possible. Somebody, two individuals from two different races, actually interacted. I'm not saying it didn't have it back then, because it, it certainly did, in some kind of fashion, of course. But nowadays, this is for, nowadays is far more common, of course. But a lot of you Christians, especially back in the day, I mean, okay, it still exists to this kind of degree, uh, to various degrees today, but back then especially... A lot of you Christians acted as if that's a big no-no. Henceforth, in Star Wars, they had the Empire, like with Vader, Papacy, and all that. Uh, we're trying to say that racism is bad because they're basically space Nazis. When you think about it, yeah, speaking of Hitler. But there you go, I guess. So you use space, uh, space kind of stuff as a way to address bigotry because you can use sci-fi as, as an example of this. Of course, Star Wars was not the only one that did this kind of thing before. Be Star Trek, Star Trek, Star Trek, Star Trek. That's all I'm gonna say. Star Trek has done this multiple times in comics, novels. If anything, Star Wars, Star Trek has pretty much one up Star Wars in that regard because they did it way before Star Wars ever came around. I mean, Star Trek. Of course, Star Wars did their own version of this. You know, two pe people from different races can get along, women's rights and all that. You know, team up together to fight against the the bad people, but I'm just saying that Star Wars had done this. Be Star Trek has done this before Star Wars ever did. Is what I'm getting at. How is it that you're not you're not making a remark about that? You seem to be highly selective. It's spe yeah, speaking people being selective. That's what you're doing. But okay, I'm so confused right now. This is so confusing. Wait, there's more. Y'all would think this character, if she was a character in Star Wars, is evil just for the, because of the horns. Yeah. But I'm not done yet! Of course, apparently a woman can only be beautiful and graceful if she's a Christian. <laughs> a woman will go straight to hell just for soaring some, maybe some of her belly and cleavage. That seems wrong. But wait, there's more. So... I also we go to hell because you are into the whole die gap thing there, but okay. Here's how to order. But wait, there's more! <laughs> how do you like you So, alright, even if the clothing itself is suggestive, at least the way she's presenting herself and whatnot could be suggestive, even, the, even if the outfit she's wearing isn't suggestive at all, just the way she's presenting herself could be suggestive. Yes, of course. You know, the women, there's so many women out there who just can't help it because they are attractive in, in a lot of people's eyes. So that's not the problem. But a lot of these Christians would view that as a problem because how dare you look attractive? But even if those other p women out there that would intentionally be really playful, yes, 
this would be a problem too somehow because it's somehow a bad thing even though they're just being playful. Like how is this evil exactly? Because somehow it's so vain. Yeah, they just come off. They just want to control women. That's about it. But okay, I mean, there's more to it, really. But still, though. Now I, 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 uh, I, I'm thinking in two ways. One way I'm thinking of how to get my most money, and I don't view that as how stuff can I walk out of the restaurant. I go, the beef cost them more. <laughs> so I'm going pot roast, roast beef, ham. I know that's pork, but those meats cost them more money. If I eat six rolls, even though their rolls are delicious, that, that those rolls cost them 10 cents a piece to make. A slice of meat costs them more money, so I paid $8 or $10 or whatever to eat here, so I'm going to get an $8 or $10 meal the best I can. The other thing I do is I say, well, but you know, I don't want to walk out feeling sick because I ate all the wrong foods, so I'm also going to go and look for something green, broccoli, something like that. So that's how I approach it. You might approach it completely differently. My children approach it by eating pe pan. You know, rolls, pizza, french fries, and then after they get done eating all the pan stuff they want, mashed potatoes, um, then they go and they get dessert, right? Chocolate fountains, uh, pie, ice cream, those kinds of things, all right? Because that's what they like. But we're like children at the Golden Corral. You know, if you sent a child alone to Golden Corral, how many times do you think they'd go get broccoli? That would actually help them, right? It's zero. How many times do you think they, if they had their choice, if they, they would go straight to the to the dessert buffet? Many children would go straight to the dessert buffet, right? That's what we've done religiously in America. Okay, I'm not trying to get too technical here. I'm not using it. So let's talk about those are the influences. What about the development of popular culture in America? America in the early days had, as I said. Okay, I don't see what I want to eat has to do with anything. Like if I go to Wendy's. Yes, I have a choice to go to Wendy's or McDonald's or Burger King or whatever. And for argument's sake, let's say I, go, I went to Wendy's. And it's my choice to choose maybe getting five hamburgers or ten hamburgers. That's my choice. That's capitalism for you. But, okay, what I have to eat and whatnot, and what I want to eat, what does that have to do with anything? strains of culture that was the enduring Western culture of Europe and England, especially England and the folk cultures of regions of America. And you will know some of the things from these cultures. Okay, Appalachia has its own kind of cultural influences, right? Things like bluegrass music might come out of that. Um, so, for example, I was talking to Stephen Bender when we were in Scotland this summer. The people who settled Appalachia were Scot-Irish. And if you hear the Appalachian music, and then you hear Scottish and Irish music, they sound very similar. Because... Okay, this just goes into what I was trying to say a moment ago, folks. Just very, very controlling. Only the righteous will survive. Only the righteous will have an everlasting life. The whole concept of heaven itself, it, it just seems ridiculous, if you ask me. It's, it's nonsensical. I mean, I could make an entire video on the whole idea behind how heaven itself makes no sense. It's silly. It's so, so damn goofy. It seems like a little kid will come up with. Yet, I'm supposed to take this seriously? But again, it just goes back to what I just was saying a moment ago. Control, 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 control. It just seems like this individual is living up to the Christian stereotype. You just want to control everybody. Like, what the hell? Just mind your business. How is that so hard? Mind your business. They knew and adapted it to their new American setting. And so, hear these tunes and you're like, is that Scottish? If you played it on bagpipes, it sounds Scottish. If you play it on a mandolin in Appalachia, it sounds Appalachian, right? And you could talk about the various cultures. New England is going to have some distinctive things to its culture, right? Tidewater, Virginia is going to have certain distinctive elements of its culture. The Gulf Coast of the United States is originally settled by Spanish and French, and so you get down into the bayou, and they've got cultural differences. Right? Oh no, people have culture differences. That somehow is a bad thing. <sighs> like really? That seems awfully racist, don't you think? Then what was the whole thing you were saying about Hitler? Then what was the whole remark about that? Then how are you any different than the close-minded individuals than you? So okay, people have the different cultures. So? I mean, in this day and age, a lot of people seem to be more accepting. I'm not saying that they weren't back then, I'm just pointing that out. Like, what are you talking about? Their own expressions of things, own traditions, and all of this. Those are folk cultures. 
And so many of you grew up with some experience of folk culture. That you, some of you remember the day that people actually got together to make music rather than bought recorded music to listen. They got their guitars and banjos or whatever the background was, and they got on the front porch and they played music together. Or they got in the, in the parlor or the sitting room and they played music together. And it was cultural music of that folk culture. Um, and it was accessible to people. And so there's songs when we were, we were driving back from South Carolina and we were coming down I-75 and we crossed right near, not too far from I-10, and you crossed the Suwannee River. And you know what? There's a sign that says Suwannee River and then it's got the musical notes actually on a staff. Okay, you saw a sign somewhere when you were traveling that had a musical note on it? Okay, uh, what significance does this have to do with Star Wars? Or anything else for that matter? You're just jumping all over the place, really. I know, again, I know he's trying to tie this to Star Wars in some kind of fashion. In some kind of fashion, I mean, because there's a connection because of the 70s when the first film was released. Right there. You know, because the, the Swanee River, you know, that's a folk song. And uh, so we know those kinds of things that were part of folk songs. You know, one of the things that, and I'll illustrate this in just a minute, is that our, our young people don't know much about those folk culture things. If we ask our young people, can you sing, you know, Swanee River? They're not going to be able to do that. Some can. Many can. Um, certainly the average teenager in America could. Or so many of the, the you know, um, the, the songs. That, that were folk songs. Uh, oh, my darling, oh, my darling, fun and time. You know, those kinds of things. That, well, what is that about? I mean, that doesn't even, we don't even know, you know, that, we don't even know the background of that song, the setting of that song. It's just not a culture. I think it's, you know, about the California gold rush, if I remember right. Something about a minor, 49er, and those kinds of things. Um, <clears throat> and then there's, you know, there's verses to it that we don't always remember. I remember being somewhere and they were singing the verses to it. And one of the verses was about a bike that. Clementine dies, and then the next verse is, how I missed her, how I missed her, how I missed my Clementine, then I kissed her little sister. They're rambling on again. Somebody somewhere on some river bank somewhere is singing some folklore songs in, in a forest or something. What does that have to do with anything? You're just rambling on about nothing. This is literally nothing. You're just talking about nothing. I don't care about any of this. If they want to do that, leave them alone. That's completely and utterly irrelevant to the topic at hand. We were supposed to be talking about Star Wars, remember? I thought that was the whole idea here. Oh, uh, Christ almighty. <laughs> But what happened in America after the Civil War, you think about what was going on technologically at the time, was printing presses started turning on newspapers, and newspapers were affordable to the average person that people could read. And guess what? How do you pay for a newspaper? Advertisements. And advertisements started to say, hey, you want to use our toothpaste? Do you want to use our soap? Do you want to buy our ladies? You want to buy hats? You want to be... Wait, what? What is this business about somebody wearing pants? Somebody putting them out selling pants to somebody else and then purchasing them somewhere? I would talk, still talking about the same area with the river bank or whatever that was you were talking about a moment ago. Like I said, people like this just keep going on and on and on about nothing. What does any of this have to... Oh, wait, I just asked that. Okay, yes, people sell products if they want. It could be skirts, it could be underwear, the undergarments, I don't know, what have you. If they want to sell this kind of thing somewhere, they have every right to do that if they want to. Like I said earlier, this is capitalism. So if they want to sell, if they want to put up shop somewhere, as long as they have to permit, that is, they can do that if they feel like it. Sure, if they make a, want to make money off some random product, sure, by all means, go for it. Uh, again, going with the whole idea of choice, making choices, like we were saying earlier, folks, like the whole burger thing earlier. European cultural influences, so you think about this vaudeville and these kind of things, what did they do? They played off of the shared values of Western Europe, and especially England, using themes from like Shakespeare, 
So you know the, the um, Marx Brothers and the Three Stooges actually have skits that are based on Shakespearean themes? Today people don't even get that they're referring to Shakespeare, but back in the 19-teens, in the 1920s, when they were doing those things, people laughed because they knew it was a reference to Hamlet. And they knew they were making jokes about Hamlet. Okay, you can't make a joke about Hamlet today and have anybody get it. <laughs> Except for a few educated people. Okay? Make use of classical music and Western history and talk about things that everybody just seemed to share that they all learned in school. In the mid-20th century, Americans did not share the knowledge of Western cultural tradition. We started to lose that. There okay, th this, this stuff is making my head hurt, all right? Okay, the thing is that, technically speaking... The Christianity came from the Middle East, and it just branched off to something else, kind of like how Buddha, Buddhism originated from India, and that branching it off into some other stuff, like we came to Japan, then to China and all that. But okay, it's not an American thing at all whatsoever, but sure, go ahead. You no longer have. You can't refer to Shakespeare. Not everybody understands it, but you can talk about the Old West, and every American knows some of those stories because uh, you had Buffalo Bill going around traveling with a show, a Bodilian style show, with the West going as part of popular culture. So there's some of you in here that grew up with Westerns. All right? In fact, that was, it was described as America's um, mythology, if you would. The Western was it. Again, this isn't a Christian nation at all. I mean, yes, of course, America is known for being these kind of uptight religious type of individuals. That's true. But that doesn't mean this is a Christian nation. Yes, of course, a lot of people have been converting to Christianity because of America. Sure. Again, that's true. And those many other cultures that never heard the word of Jesus. Again, that's true. And yes, those people attending church less and less in this day and age, that's true. But so what? What does that have to do with anything? How many grew up in here hearing Fred Foy, some of you know that name, say, Return with us now to those thrilling days of yesteryears. Out of the past come the thrilling hoofbeats of the gray horse Silver. The Lone Ranger rides again, right? <laughs> I hope Silver away. All right, many of you grew up hearing that. And remembering what it was about, whether it was the black and white television show of the Lone Ranger, or whether it was on the radio, and that was, it captivated the imagination of America, because it was very American. Okay, yes, the Western genre definitely became one of the most popular genres in American cinema and television. And yes, it was the first genre to actually become super popular. And yes, back in the hand day, Way back when, yes, they would just crank these movies out like crazy. And yes, I actually reviewed quite a few of these movies, by the way, folks. Just so you know, that I did, I do have a playlist of reviewing, of reviewing just some of the most obscured, low-budget Western movies, just so you know. I don't see what this has to do with Star Wars. I mean, what? The fact that Star Wars was originally supposed to be a Western, to some extent? That, I guess? That's the connection? You know what? There was nobody in Australia mostly sitting there going, I can't wait for Lone Ranger to come out. It didn't resonate with them, okay? But it had that shared folk culture of Westerns in America. And so many of you remember the heyday of Westerns. However, by the 1960s, what happened to the Western? It started to wane. And by the 1970s, it was mostly gone, except in Italy, where they started to make spaghetti Westerns. This left them void. So think about this. If we gave up most of what we knew about Western civilization and our, that, that shared common culture, and then we lost then the Western which was what we shared as far as, as far as, um, you know, folk culture. Now we've lost Western culture, we've lost folk culture. The only thing left is popular culture, and it changes all the time. And in the 1970s, what were films like in the 1970s? They were these... What do you mean we lost our culture? I know he's referring to the Christian culture. And yes, of course, movie tastes do change over the years. Even though the Western genre from, from the heyday from way back when it does have his charm, but still, he was just stagnated when you think about it, but okay. Gritty, depressing kind of things for the most part, weren't they? If you know a little bit about films from the 1970s, they tended to be Easy Rider and these kind of grungy films about drug dealing and motorcycle gangs and things like that. 
And they were realism, hyper realism, and depressing anti hero kind of films. You know what I'm talking about? There's no real hero, everybody's flawed, everybody's got a problem, everybody lives like a degenerate, and that's what our films are about. And that's a lot of the 1970s films that describe this stuff. So guess what? Somebody comes on the scene in the late 1970s and says, I think we need a new mythology. I'm going to quote from you. George Lucas is the producer and writer of Star Wars. And I quote from you an interview he had in 1999 with Time Magazine. Well, of course, just like I stated way earlier, all this entire thing was just built on Star Wars. I mean, yes, yeah, Star Wars is basically at its core good guys versus bad guys kind of thing, sure. I mean, that's always simplifying it. I'm aware of that. Okay, these are the good guys and these are bad guys and they don't like each other. That's kind of what this is and whatnot, but sure. So what? That goes into what I said earlier, taste change. Here's what he says. I see Star Wars as taking all the issues that religion represents and trying to distill them down into a more modern and easily, easily accessible construct. I put the force into the movie in order to try to awaken a certain kind of spirituality in young people. Remember, this is 1977. More a belief in God than a belief in any particular... What the hell are you talking about? Yes, they used the force in Star Wars, but this was not meant to be a replacement of God. This doesn't mean that... God is going to be replaced in real life. What are you talking about? That doesn't make any sense. You're just jumping the gun here. Religious system. I wanted to make it so that young people would begin to ask questions about the mystery. So his point was to be spiritual. He intended the movie to be spiritual. You understand this. Because he had felt like that it all been jettisoned and there was no shared mythology. Every culture has a shared mythology. Let me, let me define what I'm saying here. Many times we use the word mythology to mean fiction. I'm going to use the word mythology to mean both true and fiction stories that shape culture. So, for example, did, did our King Arthur really exist? There's actually a debate among historians about whether he did. Some say, yes, he was a minor king on the west coast of England. Some say, no, he was completely a legend. But the fact is, the Arthurian myths shape the ideals of what a good king and knight should be in England. Right? So that's their mythology. They're sharing shared values. In other words, by telling a story, they're sharing things about what's right, what's good, what's wholesome, what's a hero. Okay, you glancing over a lot of stuff here, quite obviously. You're doing that again. Because, yes, the Jedi will have their own values. And, of course, yeah, the villains themselves are going to have their own values, too, because they're going to fight for what they believe in, just like, like the Jedi would. So, again, again, what are you talking about? Just rambling on and on and how society is changing, how cinema could be a major factor in this. I mean, yes, obviously film itself can be a powerful tool to bring in different perspective into society. That's that's actually true. He's not actually lying about that, really, when you think about it, because film itself can be used as a tool to bring in different storytelling and whatnot. And yes sci-fi can be a great way to bring in different perspectives when it comes to politics and whatnot. That, that's true. I mean, he's still full of shit because he's technically lying because he's thinking as if that the films of Star Wars, the original trilogy, was a method to go against what he will believe to be what is righteous and what is God and whatnot. What are you talking about? And let's note, there are some things in it that make it this way. There's a conflict between good and evil, which every good mythology is going to have. There's a transcendent spiritual power greater than human beings. All right? There's a religious aspect to it. Hate and personal wrath are linked with evil. Noble self-sacrifice is tied with good, and that's all in the story. Okay, I don't... I still don't see how this entire franchise... Or even if you just want to talk about the original three films from... An, from way back when, how they were anti-God, how they anti-Jesus, anti-the Virgin Mary and whatnot. W what? This makes no sense. Okay, so those things draw people to the story. So 
let's talk about the background. I want to talk about the influences on George Lucas. Where did he get these ideas? And I, as I did my research, came across a description of a man named Joseph Campbell. Now, I was not that familiar with Joseph Campbell leading up to the time. Joseph Campbell was a popular writer and researcher in the early 20th century on matters pertaining to India, Hinduism, and mythology, especially mythology. He became famous for his motto, follow your bliss. How many of you have ever heard of that? You may not have known it was just from Joseph Campbell. Okay, probably only a few of you, but I've heard it before. Follow your bliss. All right? Joseph Campbell was a wannabe scholar. Most of the real scholars in Sanskrit literature and other things from ancient India due to kind of a hack. But he was a popular writer. He wrote books. Other people write books about Sanskrit literature, and only the few handful of PhDs in America that care about it read it. <laughs> Joseph Campbell wrote about it and sold thousands of copies. Okay? So he was actually influential. He said this. Now, I came to this idea of bliss because in Sanskrit, which is the greatest spiritual language of the world, there are three terms that represent the brink, the jumping off place of the ocean of transcendence. Sat, Chit, Ananda. He says the word Sat means being. The word Chit means consciousness. And the word Ananda means bliss or rapture. I thought, I don't know whether my consciousness is proper consciousness or not. I don't know whether I, what I know of my being is proper being or not. But I do know where my rapture is. Now notice what he just did. This is very postmodern America. He's taking this Hindu religious philosophy that says the place where you experience the transcendence is in what your consciousness, your being, and your bliss, what you are enraptured by. And he said, he took this, and what he said was, I don't know whether my consciousness is right. I don't know whether my being is right. It's very postmodern. In other words, this is unknowable, but I know what I feel. My rapture, my bliss. Okay? So he said, I don't know whether what is, this is right or not, but I do my rapture is. So I let me hang on to rapture, and that will bring me both consciousness and my being. And I think it worked. Now, if you think about the way he boils this down, let me make this real simple. It was a whole bunch of mumbo-jumbo about, about Hindu philosophy, but let me boil it down. Oh, yes, of course. He's really attempting to beat you over the head with this whole Jesus stuff because, yes, he's using the Bible itself, the stories within the Bible, as a way to support his claim. Which, again, doesn't do anything, because it just leads to more questions, but okay, sure. That is nothing more than hedonism. Follow whatever you like. Whatever excites you, that's what you should do with your life. Okay? That is who, and, and this is not my making this up, uh, this, this is a person who George Lucas credits with encouraging him. Another famous theory of Joseph Campbell's was that of monomyth. He believed that in the psychic unity of humanity, in other words, all human beings share a thing. By psychic, I don't mean like predicting the future. What he meant by that was we all, we all share the same soul, the same characteristics of soul, and that all myths were expression of the same dreams, aspirations, fears, questions, etc. that all human beings have. And he advocated for a new expression of these myths. So yes, the fact that the Jedi characters are able to use the forest to list, lift up certain things from the ground or whatever. He's acting as if that is somehow going to tap into humans' ability of telekinesis, like in real life, like how people can believe that you can use telekinesis or whatever. Like somehow there's a clue in this somewhere. It doesn't make any sense. Again, what's the connection exactly? You're just talking to shit out of your ass. Again. Values, okay? The Roman expression of that, the Hindu expression of that, the Christian expression of that are all outdated in Joseph Campbell's view. So what we need is a new mythology which would capture the imaginations of postmodern people. He advocated for. Now, let me step one one more step, and that is what are the religious influences on George Lucas? George Lucas grew up Methodist. And he considers himself Christian. In fact, if you ask him, he basically says he's a Buddhist Methodist. I took a trip to Israel one time, and one of the guys I was traveling with was studying for the ministry. And he said he was a Muslim Pentecostal Baptist. <laughs> Very confused young man. And so he grew up in a Methodist background, and he was very familiar. Uh, sweet baby Jesus, holy shit. Yeah, this just sounds mad insecure. He's acting as if, like, the humans are going to have this ability to become more strong than God. 
I am better than God. I will have more powers, more abilities than Jesus Christ himself. This, this individual just sounds mad insecure. That's what I'm getting at. He sounds mad insecure. Holy shit, man. Ugh. Uh -huh. Like so many of his generation, he grew up a baby boomer. He explored Eastern religions, specifically Buddhism. The pantheistic worldview of Buddhism is evident in his films. Here's what pantheism is. The biblical view of God, and we're going to look at this, is that there is one true and living God who is a person, but he's transcendent above everything. Pantheism says everything's God. God is contained within everything. The creation and God are not separate from each other. Okay? And that Buddhism is actually evident in the Star Wars. Okay. Let me give you a few quotes here from uh, from George Lucas as well. I got a couple others that I think would be helpful for you. And the influence. Let me note the influence of Star Wars here. Today's census figure shows that 176,632 people in England and Wales identify themselves as Jedi Knights, <laughs> making it the most popular faith in the other religions category on the census, and the seventh most popular faith overall in the UK. <laughs> Obviously, Christianity and Islam, I don't know how they break down Christianity between Catholic and Protestant, but the seventh most popular religion in the UK is Jedi Knights, people call themselves that, and are serious about it. You're looking, a lot of you are looking at me like, are you kidding? No, this is not a joke. There are people out there who believe this is their religion. Now, I do know in America, I think in the last census, there was a group of people that got together and they wanted to give so many responses to say certain religion and the census is supposed to put it on the census questionnaire the next time as an official category, and a bunch of Americans did that just as a joke to try to get it on. The problem is it's against the law of lies the census, and so some of them were threatened with prosecution because they said they were Jedi, and that wasn't really their religion. But I don't doubt that there's still plenty of Americans who, if you ask them their religion, they'll say, I'm a Jedi. Okay, I've met some of them. I've met some Okay, yes. Christianity does remain culturally decisive in its Western and Eastern branches and doctrinally decisive as well concerning many versions of the Bible, of course, in various Christian denominations generally held in the common name of Jesus as, as a son of God, while others, of course, accept God as Jesus. So it depends which one you're talking about. But of course, they would have this concern about the justification and the nature of salvation, stuff like this. So yes, of course, these individuals, the pastors, who have their churches, they were talking about the, those who have suffered, the individual who died on the cross, like Jesus, I suppose. And then the whole idea that Jesus rose from the dead for the salvation of mankind, I just referred to to as the gospel, meaning the good news. Yes, of course, obviously, there was Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, who had described as Jesus' life and teachings with the, within the Old Testament as the gospel's respective background. And whether these people existed or not is an entire debate on its own. But what I'm trying to get is that, yes, obviously, Christianity itself did change of the years. The way it's practiced, let's say, in the 1930s, of course, it's going to be different the way it's practiced, let's say, in the 1960s and 70s. The culture itself of American culture is like a whole hodgepodge of different cultures anyway. Despite the fact that a lot of people believe that it's just a Christian nation, when in reality it really isn't. So, anyway, what like I was saying is that, yes, Christianity has changed over the years, of course, and they have this kind of influence. And yes, in the Rome era, of course, they had these disciples of Jesus Christ spread their faith around the Eastern part era, despite some people disagreeing with what we have to say, of course. And yes, obviously, there's the whole thing with the Roman Empire, there's like a whole history of that, of course, we were at the Early Christianity was brought up into what would become the state of religion of the Roman Empire, then the Church of the East, who of course come to play as well. The Church of the East, an Orthodox, both split into all different 
and whatnot. So, like I was saying, there's also the Roman Catholic, of course, and then there's the whole idea of people in Mexico will practice Catholicism. It's the same thing with Cuba. The, their version of of the Catholic Church would be different, of course, and compared to, let's say, how it's practiced in Scotland. Well, I'm saying, yes, the Catholic faith is probably the one of the most mainstream versions of the Bible. And even those have it, even the Catholic have its own subsets as well when it comes to their belief system, along with Christianity itself as well, of course. And obviously, all these will come together in the name of Jesus, but even though despite the fact that these individuals will have disagreements because each individual branch will claim that they're the true version of the Bible. While some of these people will be more lenient than others, of course, uh, some some of these individuals will accept that those different versions, of course, of the Bible and whatnot. And that just goes from portion to portion. But for the most part, a lot of these individuals want to stick to their own version of the Bible. And yes, there's also the Muslim faith as well. The Muslim faith has its own branches as well, which a lot of people don't seem to know that really. Yes, the Muslim faith will have their own versions of the Bible, the Quran, I guess, and whatnot. So, again, you'd be surprised how many people don't know that whatsoever. And yes, even because with the Muslim faith, even that changed over the years. It's not always going to be 100% the same. Even the Muslim faith has changed over the years, of course. Because when you think about it, even the Ottoman Empire has its own its history. The, uh, the Ottoman Empire, which has something to do with the whole Muslim thing, it has its own, of course, thing for a good while. I mean, yes, it changed. It's not exactly 100% the same like it was back then, compared to back then and now. Just like how the Catholic faith is and the Christianity as a whole. Things do change. Cultures do change. It's, it's bound to happen sooner or later. It's the same thing with, same thing with Cuba. Cuba, of course, is communist, but that's besides the point I'm getting at. You know, they do believe in the whole Catholic thing, at least their version of it anyway. But point being is that you can't even mention the whole idea in the Philippines. The Philippines have their own version of this as well, when you think about it. Yes, I do realize I'm, to some extent I'm going all over the place with, with this kind of thing, but it's just that this whole conversation here start off really, really robbly. But anyway... So yes, things do change over the years. People can change their minds. Societies do change. I don't see what the problem is exactly because none of this is adding up, obviously. But somehow, yes, of course, you can argue, you can always bring up the fact that yes, Star Wars is one of the most influential franchises of all time, and that's that's true, and he has such a culture impact on a lot of people. And even today, even to this very day, it still has its own cultural impact in one form or another or in one way or another. That's, that's absolutely true. But, again, my issue, my major issue is that this entire thing is extremely vague. It's so vague. What does any of this have to do with anything? I have no idea. I'm just, I'm just completely lost in all this, really. And yes, like I was saying, yes, the Jedi characters have their own belief system. That's that's true. And yes, even the bad guy characters, the, like Vader, Palpatine, and so on and so forth. I mean, yes, they have their own belief system. Yes, they believe in they're in the right. So like in the Jedi, they believe in they're in the right. And yes, this will cause, of course, will cause them to be in conflict with each other. Each side is claiming to be in the right. Not only that, there's also... The villains, even the villains fight against each other because other villains, maybe they get like maybe there could be like a second group, a third group. It could be like maybe ten groups of bad of villains, and each individual group could be fighting against each other because each individual one have their own belief system to be in the right. Which, uh, which of course, in the Star Wars expanded universe, does happen. Not only that, that happens in real life. You, do you think every single criminal? out there, every single serial killer, every single robber agrees with each other? No. Alright, that'll be it, folks. So, thanks for watching. Just, I'll get part two up as soon as I can.